This initiative that we're putting on today, the workshops, it's just a part of our program in regards to education on, on this uh, very important portfolio and just our forklift awareness program alone, that's one of the aspects that we operate and that's getting the, the clear message out to all stakeholders on the, the requirements and, and what needs to be done to keep this great market safe. You're an excellent example of a very uh, a large workspace but also a, a space that has over 5,000 people You have your customers, your traders and I think that's a great example for other workplaces as well. So I take my hat off to you. I know the exchanges are probably very robust with you know, a number of the traders, but know that you have our full support as government in terms of what you're doing. You're a great example, and I'm gonna take a lot of the ideas that I've heard this morning from you on the ground um, and from the team here um, about what we can do in other workplaces as well. Hi, I'm Leighton Freedy. Work Health Safety Manager for Sydney Markets. You're about to meet Mark Ellis, a man whose life has been impacted by a forklift accident. Here is his story. So this particular morning, 18th of May 2016, um, I, my role was basically in the office part, doing the paperwork, the computer work, all that sort of stuff for the inventory that was out in the warehouse. One of the girls from upstairs in sales asked me to go and look and see if there was a particular product, which was a five millimetre piece of steel rod, about four metres long. Anyway, five millimetres is so small. I went looking for it, couldn't find it, came back from the office, got some more information, went out again. When I went out the second time, I'm looking in cantilever racking, so we had big racking and I couldn't, it wasn't there. There's was only supposed to be one piece there, but because it's so small, it can get easily lost. So anyway, I thought, oh, not there. So where's the bulk location? So I looked on the printout I had, and the bulk location was, you know, 20 feet in the air. And I've taken one step back like that to look and see if I can see it from there. And as I step back, a forklift caught my right foot and dragged it underneath. And that forklift was a big side load of forklift like that. So my foot went under one of the archways there and then along under this small piece here. So a leg versus concrete and steel had no chance. So I still remember everything that happened. As crazy as it sounds, as my foot went under, the only thought I had was, and it was on a Wednesday, my only thought I had was, I've got to play golf on Sunday. How am I going to play golf if I've got a crook foot? Stupid, but that's the stuff you sort of think of. The forklift reverses off me. I was so lucky that the only thing that got hurt was my leg. So even though I fell sideways down onto concrete, I didn't hurt anything else, didn't hurt my head, didn't hurt arms, nothing else. The only thing that was hurt was this leg. Two of the warehouse guys, one quickly sat on the ground and crossed his legs and put my head in his legs, like that. Trying to keep me conscious, then when we passing out, all that sort of stuff. And another guy, within seconds and how people he still to this day doesn't know why he thought of it or how he thought of it he's one thing after the other grabbed one of those ties and they wrapped it around my leg up here and various doctors and paramedics and the like have said that probably saved your life because the chances of me bleeding to death were high at that stage because I've got a crushed leg all the way up to just above my knee and I remember ambulances, sirens and all that sort of stuff that they kept me very conscious so that I you know didn't pass out. I didn't have any pain so it was obviously adrenaline and I remember the first ambulance guy that got there he was one of the sort of uh, district supervisors or whatever so he just came drove in on his own and I'm laying on the ground I'm talking to a couple of my colleagues so they're giving me a water and keeping me talking to them and this 
ambulance driver looked over, and I'll never forget it. And you could see in his face that he had no idea what he could do. He was just overwhelmed by this, you know, smashed leg out one way and a black lane the other way and whatever. But within what seemed another minute to me, a uh, paramedic turned up and he knew exactly what was going on. And I guess from my point of view, within seconds, he gave me the confidence that I knew I was going to be okay. I don't remember too much after that until I got into the ambulance and they took me off to Liverpool Hospital. By that stage, I was doped up to the eyeballs with all sorts of medication. But I certainly distinctly remember getting there and I must have been partly, well I was, partly conscious and I saw my wife. They'd gone and got her work and organised to get her back to Liverpool Hospital. And I said to her, I said, look, so whatever you've got to do, whatever you've got to sign, just do it, get them to chop this leg off, because I know it's no good. And uh, the surgeon was standing there too, and <laughs> Linda said, don't tell me, tell him. And I said, just chop it off. You know, you're never gonna, he said, look, I don't think there's much I can do. So anyway, over a period of uh, five days, I had three operations, which eventually ended up in me having an amputation about 15 centimetres above my right knee. So it's just up here. I woke up the next morning and I thought to myself, well, I can't change it. This is what it is. As bad as it might seem, I just had the attitude, and I guess I always had the attitude for, uh, in most things, if I can't change it, what's the point of me worrying about it? Even in a work sense or a life sense or whatever, if I can't do something to change it, well, it's no good me worrying about it. So. Anyway, by that stage, obviously, Linda was back there again the next morning and I said to her, look, this is, this is the way it is. We just got to get on with life and, you know, a new chapter in our lives and what happens from here on happens from here on. It's just very easy to be complacent and it just shows, you know, how easy it is and how quick an accident can happen and change a person's life and their, and their family's life. It was very educational and it's something I think all old time forklift drivers need to know. It's not about the job, it's about the safety because we're all pumped in our head, get the order out, get the order out. It's not about that, it's about watching out. It's not until you see something like that that you actually understand just how much of an impact it can have on people's lives, the people around them, the witnesses to it. And not using the horn, which is something a lot of the bosses find irritating and a lot of staff find irritating, but I now realise how important it is because they're a wig around you. It just makes you think that maybe that one or two seconds is so important. People just want to come to work and they want to go home, you know. Everyone wants to go home after work. <laughs> On behalf of Sydney Markets, I'd like to thank Mark for sharing his story. So we all better understand the implications of a workplace accident, not only on yourself, but those around you. Remember, no job is that urgent, it can't be done safely. Thank you.